Thank you very much, Mr. Waters. Ladies and gentlemen, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today and engage in an open debate on democracy and the rule of law in Europe. And let me start also by thanking Reconnect because you are an inspiration. You are giving me a lot of uh, valuable uh, reflections on, on our work and on the situation in Europe. Sometimes it's a difficult reading because uh, it is critical, but this is exactly what I need. Uh, I don't need to speak only to those who agree with me. I, of course, need to um, read the, the broad uh, range of opinions, uh, which give me more objective uh, reflection of, of our work and of what should be done. And I personally very much appreciate that the main theme of our meeting today is about reconciling Europe with its citizens through democracy and the rule of law. I confess that I often find myself thinking about how we can reach two citizens and show them the importance of democracy and the rule of law. For a long time, I have been convinced that the best solution for many issues we are facing today is in the hands of citizens. Me and the Commission as a whole have an important duty, but also you, researchers, academics, government officials, and activists also have a very important role to play in this. But as long as our conversation about democracy and the rule of law remains among experts, we will not be able to solve existing problems, let alone improve our democracies. This is even more important in the context of a pandemic that is deeply affecting every aspect of our life including the way we debate political issues or participate in elections. These events, the events of the beginning of the year in Washington, are a stark reminder of the nature of our democracies. They are fragile by definition, and their resilience can only be ensured by strong institutions firmly anchored in the rule of law. But it is clear that in Europe we too face many similar challenges. Allow me first to briefly explain how I understand the rule of law and democracy and why I think it impacts every citizen. Then I would like to remind you briefly how I see the role of the European Commission in upholding democracy and the rule of law. And then I would want to conclude with my aspirations for action in 2021. Let me state the obvious first. Democracy, rule of law and fundamental rights are the three pillars forming the bedrock of the European Union. They cannot exist without one another, even less used against one another. They are the basis for everything else in the EU and they are projected to all other policies, be it green, be it digital or beyond. This is largely what makes the EU unique. I understand there are many excellent lawyers with us today, so they would know what I am talking about. Article 7, the rulings of the Court of Justice and so on. But of course, this is not how you will connect with citizens. I am a lawyer myself and I, if I try to speak like that to my family, they would throw me out of the house. So we must go beyond these legal definitions and translate them into everyday language with a clear meaning. For me, who was born in communist Czechoslovakia, it is somehow easier to understand because I myself experienced a life where, not, where these uh, values were not respected. I remember well, judges were there to service the few, not the many. We did not have any illusion of their independence from the party or from the government, which was the same thing, by the way. The media were broadcasting propaganda and did not hold power into account. And elections were a mirage. To put it simply, there were many laws, but they did not rule those in power. Today, in modern Europe, we see that some borrow solutions from the authoritarian playbook. They want to switch off as many of those democratic safety valves as, as possible, be it judges, media or opposition. The big question is why so many people do not seem to mind this. 
On the contrary, with their voting decisions, they seem to accept it or even support it. There is no simple answer to this, and each country has its own context. But let me at, let me be attempt let me attempt to find a common denominator. I think too many people got disappointed with democracy and democratic forces. In times of crisis, people demand to see quick solutions. The current pandemic is a stark reminder of this. And we live in the world of supercharged transitions, like digital or green, which only add to people's feeling of instability and insecurity. But we seemed to believe that democracy would defend itself and that many societal problems like inequality, poverty or unemployment would go away uh, if you just give it time. So we left wide open space for demagogues and as Anne Applebaum writes in her recent book, The Twilight of Democracy, The Clerks, to occupy the space and abuse people's frustrations. Many people did or do not believe that the judiciary is independent enough or that the media are objective enough. And if you do not think of something as good or helpful and your personal situation is dire, you are not sorry to see it burn. We at the Commission are fully aware of all of this and try our best to act and to inspire others to act with us. Allow me now to go into some details of our actions. As you could hear from my introduction, I think this is a complex reality and our policy responses have to capture this complexity. This is why the European Democracy Action Plan, which we adopted last December, tries to be a comprehensive response to many important issues, especially touching upon democracy in the online world. We have seen the rise of extremism, especially online, a lack of transparency and accountability of online platforms, insufficient application of rules relevant for elections in the digital world, or sometimes lack of any rules. We have seen interference in our democratic processes by foreign actors, and the situation of the media and safety of journalists is deteriorating. All these issues affect the extension and quality of our democratic deliberative space. And COVID-19 pandemic is only making those risks even stronger and more endangering. So the Democracy Action Plan tries to react on all these varying trends, and I will name four of them. We try to come with the tools with the new tools and solutions by protecting the integrity in the electoral process, by involving and empowering the public, by strengthening the media, and last but not least, by fighting disinformation and foreign interference. What we were doing in practice, I will propose legislation on transparency in online political advertising, so people will know why they are seeing an ad, who paid for it, how much, what micro-targeting criteria were used. New technologies should be tools for emancipation, not for manipulation. This is also why we will look at limiting the micro-targeting criteria. We have just launched a public consultation on this initiative and I invite all of you to have your say. Then, to help the media and journalists, we are working on a recommendation on safety of journalists and an initiative to fight abusive litigation against journalists. Uh, the recommendation will go to the member states because the member states have the uh, monopoly in uh, securing the safety of their citizens. By coming back to media as, as the sector, we also want to increase the transparency of media ownership and of state advertising. Public money should not be used to favour only those who sympathise with the ones in power. We will also increase financial support to fund cross-border journalistic investigations. The last element of the plan is our counter-disinformation. I have to stress 
that these actions firmly respect fundamental rights, including freedom of speech. There will be no censorship, as we are not looking to ban or remove disinformation content. The silencing of Donald Trump, no matter how despicable his messaging could be, has reminded us that we should all think about where to draw the line and not leave the decision to CEOs of big tech alone. At the same time, we cannot be naive and pretend there is no problem. Disinformation is like salt slowly being put in our wounds. The disinformation narratives about COVID vaccine are a perfect example of that. This is why we are proposing to make a step change uh, by equipping ourselves with tools to impose costs on those who penetrate our systems with malicious intention. The producers of disinformation cannot remain untouched. My goal here is to empower democratic actors and allow people to understand what content they see and why, so that they can make their choices freely. Then we also need much more from the channels where disinformation is distributed, especially online platforms. New anti-disinformation -dis pact with platforms advertisers, websites, and the civil society to improve accountability and transparency of algorithms, to stop allowing websites making money on disinformation, to design better ways to deal with manipulation through bots or with the use of fake accounts and artificial intelligence. We must protect the marketplaces of ideas, including those we might not like. In order to avoid creating any ministry of truth in case of harmful content, we should not so much focus on the content itself, but on how it is amplified. The right to speak does not mean a right to reach. Finally, we will look at recipients of disinformation. We will look at how the citizens uh, approach that and whether they have the open uh, possibility to make a choice. Honestly, this plan is about the citizens. The long-term solution lies in education and in media literacy. We are supporting also financially civil society to help and of course we have many proposals to increase the efforts in education and awareness raising side for instance with the European education strategy which was presented a few months back. So it was the European Democracy Action Plan. I'm looking forward to your question. The questions, it is fresh. It is opening several uh, uncharted uh, territory chapters. So I am ready to, uh, to uh, describe more in details what's in the plan. But allow me now turn to uh, to the instruments for the defense of the rule of law. The rule of law, as we all know, has been a growing issue over the last decade, with the Commission becoming more active to address different situations and problems. The last decade forced us to test and then strengthen the tools we have to assist the Member States, but also to try to address the risks and challenges. Thanks to the case law from the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights, we have today clear definitions of what the rule of law is and of the EU's prerogatives in this regard. Of course, I understand that our actions will not be applauded by everyone and many be considered insufficient by time. But those actions should be judged against the background of the role and mandate that the Commission has been given by the treaties. This is my daily frustration, but I have to act within the constraints set by law, because also the Commission itself is subject to the rule of law. I know that the situation in some member states has not improved. This is why I was constantly advocating for adding new legal tools. We have many soft tools, like the EU Justice Scoreboard or the Economic Semester, 
the main focus where most calls for action have been focused are the so-called Article 7 procedure and the infringement procedures. In 2017, the Commission triggered for the very first time the procedure of Article 7 of the Treaty that deals with systematic risks for the rule of law. And in 2018, the European Parliament initiated such procedure against Hungary. So the Commission triggered the procedure against Poland, to be, to be precise. The procedure of Article 7 is made to capture systemic risks and in this say, sense complement more targeted measures that we address that we address with infringement procedures. Article 7 was conceived as a nuclear option, more a threat than an instrument designed to, for real use. This is why the inbuilt Unanimity has made it difficult to progress in the Council, but the instrument has been anyway useful to advance the debate among the Member States and to show the extent of the problem. But it remains that the votes required in the Council are impossible to gather in the current political context. context. This is, however, not our only tool. We have opened many of infringement procedures when we saw a clear breach of the treaties. I think we have showed determination by bringing those cases to the European Court of Justice. The Court clarified the scope of union competence and there are pending rulings which may further determine the Commission's role in this. And we will not accept half measures or feet dragging when it comes to implementing the rulings of the Court. In January, we have proceeded very fast to the second stage of infringement on the disciplinary chamber of the Supreme Court in Poland. Uh, we will continue to fulfill our obligations by launching new infringements and turning to the court in search for justice as necessary. But it is clear that more to tools were needed to strengthen the preventive arm we propose the new comprehensive European rule of law mechanism on the basis of the annual report. In September, we published for the first time an assessment of the rule of law situation in all member states on the basis of the same methodology. The report goes beyond the justice systems, focusing also on anti-corruption frameworks, institutional issues related to checks and balances, and media freedom and pluralism. It is very important to have an overview of these issues and see the links between them, not least because separate deficiencies often merge into an undrinkable cocktail, even if the individual ingredients seem to be fine. This tool is supposed to bring the debate about the rule of law to the member states, national parliaments, civil society, other EU institutions, all of which have a role to play and hopefully also initiate a more informed public debate. Due to the pandemic, it has not been possible to fully develop this approach, but I am convinced that we will only succeed if the rule of law and democracy debate will migrate from the debate of experts to the dinner table conversations. I know that something that the rule of law report is yet another useless document when what is needed as, is a strong action. But for me, this can be an important shift because it requires the involvement of all actors, institutional and beyond. Rule of law is a shared responsibility and it can, if we all assume our part, this is not an issue that can be solved by the lonesome sheriff, by it, be it commission or any other. And let me also be clear, there is no silver bullet, no single instrument that may correct rule of law issues on its own. This common exercise should over time contribute to a creation of a consolidated common culture and shared ownership over these issues. We will clearly dispel the unfounded accusations of bias. 
This brings me to another element of our response, and this is the budget rule of law conditionality. The regulation recently adopted is not ideological. Rather, it is soberly and firmly anchored in law. The definition of the rule of law codified in Article 2 of the regulation is the only firmly anchored in the EU legal order. It is a rather precise definition. All the elements of this definition were not only confirmed by the European Court of Justice, they are also a shared value uh, of the Member States and more generally a cornerstone of the constitutional orders of any democracy. This proposal is not targeted at specific Member States. On the contrary, it is meant to capture the potential risks wherever or whenever they might appear and that deter those wherever they are who may want to dismantle the democratic checks and balances. I think it is the bare minimum to expect that EU funds will go where the rule of law is not under threat. Our values are not an addition to the single market, but rather its very foundation. As you see, the Union has strived, strived to equip itself better against the challenges to our founding values. But I must stress that Union institutions cannot on their own prevent deliberate policies by national governments against those values and that to expect that it is to wrongly frame this debate. Beyond the tools I mentioned, we need to further enrich representative democracy and foster trust and politicians need to embrace deliberative democracy, approaches like citizens' assemblies. We will soon launch the Conference on the Future of Europe to walk the talk, even in the context of the conference has changed with, even if the context of the conference has changed with the pandemic, our determination remains the same. We want to give citizens a greater say in shaping future EU policies. The objective of the conference is to build, to bring citizens and policymakers closer together and reinforce the Union's democratic legitimacy. The conference will only be a success if citizens are on board, because this is first and foremost a bottom line, a bottom up initiative. A joint declaration between the European Parliament the Council and the Commission is currently being finalised and will set out the conference's def definitive scope, objectives and governance structure, after which it will move ahead quickly. We will ensure a balanced representation of randomly selected citizens in the proposed European citizens' panels, be it in terms of geographical, gender, age and socio-economic balances. We want citizens from all walks of life to get involved. We stand ready to start the conference even if face-to-face -face meetings cannot initially take place due to the pandemic. We have been developing a multilingual digital platform which will allow for virtual contributions and online events to be organized with participants from all across the Union. The ultimate key to the conference success is our joint commitment to follow up on citizens' ideas and proposals, including through legislative action, if appropriate and in line with institutional prerogatives. Before concluding, a few words on the importance of research. As already mentioned, stable democratic systems are not a given, also not within the EU. Democracy needs to be nurtured and def defended, as uh, I heard already the quote at the beginning of, of my speech. Trust of citizens in democratic processes, and as Václav Havel noted, personal responsibility of citizens are key to this. Multiple report reports and statistics show increasing levels of dissatisfaction among citizens when assessing the performance of their democracies. And researchers can play 
an important role in the design of evidence-based policy. They can help to understand the drivers for extremism, polarization, disinformation, and the role of media and digital technologies in this. Researchers can help develop and experiment with innovative solutions and innovative policy approaches. Horizon Europe will continue the Horizon 22 support for such research and experimentation. Active engagement of citizens is the essence of democracy. Training and awareness raising as Reconnect does through its massive open online course helps a lot and I want to thank you for that. To conclude, if you ask me about the future, for me two things matter most. First, we have to act to defend democracy and the rule of law. It is not a one-off task. I have no illusion that the problems will continue to appear because democracy is a process that needs nurturing and, in fact, fighting for. And two, we have to be always respectful of voters and their elected representatives. Our role is to help ensuring that the elections and conditions for a choice are as fair as possible, but never to interfere in the choice itself. In democracy, people are the source of power and legitimacy, and our role is to make sure that they can continue to make free choices. Those of us who lived behind the Iron Curtain, those of us who know the authoritarian playbook of Putin, understand well the process in which you switch off one safety fuse after another, in which you switch off one checks and balances one after another. And uh, the moment when you switch the checks and balances completely, until the government and those in power cannot be effectively controlled. This can happen, for instance, when the judges of the Constitutional Tribunal of the Supreme Court depend on the party, depend on one ruling party. This can happen when the state owned companies whose CEOs and boards were appointed by the same party by the media to silence criticism. Our role is to react when we see such risks. As someone who does not want to see the return of the authoritarian playbook, I will be very vigilant in this regard. And final personal reflection. If I had to point at one, fine, one thing that democracies have earned, we in an authoritarian regime did not, I would say this is trust. In democracy, we trust that our neighbor is not spying on us or reports us to the authorities because we criticize those in power. We trust that the state apparatus is not there to control us, but to serve us. And the EU is an extraordinary manifestation of this trust. We trust that products made in one country will be safe also in another. We trust our fellow European citizens. We trust that the ruling of a court in one country is fair and just for every other member. We trust so much, we decided to dismantle the internal borders. This is my biggest motivation to act, to restore and uphold this trust. Because Europe without a trust is not a union. Democracy without trust is not complete or indeed possible. And Václav Havel to be quoted again, and I have him hanging on my wall behind me. I am consulting with him very often and more and more often these days. So Václav Havel was spot on where, when he wrote, quote, the natural disadvantage of democracy is that it is extremely tiring to those who mean it honestly, while it allows almost everything to those who do not take it seriously, end of quote. And if I may humbly add something today, I would also include to those who want to abuse it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much, Miss Vice President. This was really words going to our heart, and um, I think you, you you gave us a lot of food for thought, not only for our Reconnect project, but also for the many many other people that are listening, from uh, practitioners and activists to civil society and uh, academia and and, and uh, policy officers. Um, we now go into the Q&A and I must say I have been stormed with all kinds of questions for you. Some of the questions are very technical, so I will make a little bit of a selection um, uh, uh, along some broad categories. Maybe I should, if I may, uh, start with uh, questions that have to do with the annual rule of law um, uh, report. And we, we received questions about the scope of the annual rule of law uh, report. Uh, you mentioned, of course, that it is a broad scope and that it includes uh, things such as anti-corruption um, and so on. I have two specific questions in that respect. First of all, um, whether gender issues, uh, including not only discrimination to LGBTIQ communities, but also, for instance, violence um, um, against against uh, parts of the population, whether such uh, gender issues have been taken into account or should be taken into account in the rule of law uh, report. That is one question. Another question that is, <clears throat> um, is more related to the implementation of judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. We have not spoken much about the Council of Europe here, of course, but it is indeed uh, well known that <clears throat> there is a rather increasing rate of non-compliance or non-implementation with judgments of the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. And that is, of course, uh, according to one of our um, participants, a core rule of law uh, concern. So is that something which could receive more place in the rule of law uh, report. Shall I stick with those questions first? I have a number of other questions, including on the conditionality regulation, but maybe I give you first the floor for these questions. On the rule of law report, well, I, I want to be well understood uh, by when I say that we didn't want to make it too heavy vehicle and to try to, to tackle with every uh, uh, painful issue we have now and the gender issues and uh, LGBTI discrimination and the violence. This is something we desperately need to address and we are doing it through other instruments. Uh, we are uh, planning this year to propose the new Eurocrime, which concerns the, the hate speech against the, the uh, uh, concrete uh, groups of citizens who desperately need uh, stronger support, also a, a stronger uh, security or better uh, guaranteed security. So we are going for legislation. We are going for legislation uh, against violence against women. Uh, so uh, in this in this area, we want to use stronger tools. While you know that the rule of law report is important uh, tool relating to the rule of law, uh, and uh, checks and balances and anti-corruption. And you are absolutely true uh, and right that these are inter interconnected things. And we saw it in practice in the in the member states where we see backsliding on the side of the rule of law. We also see difficult problems uh, of uh, uh, warning uh, uh, or d dangerous tendencies also relating to the rights of minorities. But But we are using different instruments and uh, this year or last year, uh, it's already 21, but last year we came with the first edition of the rule of law report. We came with a strategy for the uh, implementation of the Charter of the Fundamental Rights, which is uh, very pragmatic uh, and, and focused on, on practice implementation in the member states. And uh, we came with the European Democracy Action Plan. So this holy trinity of uh, rule of law, fundamental rights, including anti-discrimination and uh, democracy uh, is uh, covered by three different instruments. And each of them 
uh, include uh, concrete actions to be taken. On, on the scope of the rule of law, I don't ex exclude that we will in, enlarge the scope, but keeping within uh, the currently designed uh, rule of law report. We are now working on the second edition. We are working on the on the new criteria and uh, or additional criteria, the methodology to assess the criteria. We will again consult very intensely with the member states because this has to be transparent and predictable, uh, predictable tour. Uh, because I said in my speech, we are we are objective. We, this is this is something we have to do together with the member states. We are now consulting with the national parliaments uh, uh, the content of the first rule of law report. This is very useful. I myself did already the Swedish parliament, the Austrian parliament. Today afternoon, I have Slo Slovak parliament. Uh, and the discussion is always very straight to the point, to the possible deficiencies in the system. This is very useful instrument in spite of not having uh, any possibility to make uh, recommendations or, or impose even some sanctions. So that's, that was the first, uh, first uh, uh, answer, uh, question or answer. The judgments of the European Court of Human Rights and their implementation in practice, while well, I'm following mainly the, is the implementation of the European Court of Justice uh, decisions, there we, we are very tough and we are really pushing the member states to do it in full. But I have to look into and consult with my colleagues uh, uh, how serious the situation here is uh, in the in the implementation of the of the uh, European Court of Human Rights decisions and what are the legal or maybe political possibilities for the Commission to act on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in the meantime, it has rained other questions, which I also try to structure a little bit, but I promise you to come back first to the conditionality regulation. A, a very important regulation, as you rightly said. Uh, some of our participants wonder whether it will indeed be an effective tool. If so, why? And if so, if not so, why not? But I have also one specific uh, question on the conditionality regulation, which took effect um, in, in January of this year. And of course, as any regulation applies for the future, but the question is there also, if a member state was already penalized, had already serious issues in the last MFF cycle for misspending EU funds and public procurement rules, audit systems, judicial systems, and so on, have not really been improved since that last MFF period and penalization. Will the Commission for the period that applies now, when the new regulation is in force, will the Commission consider indeed taking into account the previously identified weaknesses as a kind of danger signal for monitoring spending? Uh, or is the Commission uh, of the view that, in fact, 1st of January, the entry into force of the new regulation is a kind of clean slate for, for every member state? And that uh, the assumption is that all member states are in compliance until uh, proven otherwise in the future. These are two questions regarding the conditionality regulation. Yeah, thank you very much. I will I will answer the second first whether uh, we start as tabula rasa from the first of January uh, this year. Well, of course, the deficiencies uh, relating to to judiciary system. And in independence of of court and and other things, problems in the in the public procurement. Well, they do not appear from day one to day two. These are long term issues we see in in several member states. Uh, and of course, uh, the re retroactivity will not be applied here. But uh, we see the long lasting issues which we see in 2020 as well as 2021. And we will uh, collect uh, new uh, data uh, while we are already working on the, the possible application of this uh, uh, conditionality. This is partly also the, the answer on the question whether it will be effective while we are working 
on uh, the on opening the possibility to apply this rule, this conditionality, and make it if effective. So we are already working uh, with uh, the the experts uh, for for the EU budget and for 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 the criminal justice sphere. We will involve the the experts from Olaf because Olaf has a very good mapping of the situation in the member states whether. The, the EU money is sufficiently protected or not. And I want to explain one thing. Uh, there, uh, there have been uh, a, a long tradition of freezing the money. It was already in the past of freezing the EU money when uh, there are not in place sufficiently working control and auditing mechanisms. And the, the freezing of the EU money is, is was a nightmare for me when I was the Minister of, of EU funding, you can imagine. <laughs> and I was facing such situation and I had to correct the control and audit system. Uh, and now we are one floor above this because, of course, we speak about the sanction in the sense of freezing of the money. Uh, let's be bold about that. And we will do that when there will be a proven dysfunctioning uh, of the of the systems of of uh, of independent judiciary uh, which is clearly uh, stated in the or in, enshrined in the new regulation and we will have to work hard to find the uh, the line between the uh, not functioning institutions and uh, the the breach uh, or damage to the eu financial interests so the commission the commission is working on making this tool efficient and applicable we are waiting for the european court of justice uh, decision because as you know poland and hungary wanted to ask uh, the 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 for the decision about the legality of this tool uh, but we are not losing time we are now working on the guidance, how to apply that, which will be very widely consulted with the member states and with the European Parliament and with the, the uh, other relevant partners. And we are already working on the assessment of the member states, whether they are fit for application. And uh, last comment, uh, we will always uh, by working with this heavy heavyweight tool, and this is a heavyweight tool, let's not uh, be uh, naive. We will always pay attention to the interests of the final beneficiaries, not to do damage uh, to uh, regional projects, local projects, the projects of NGOs. Well, we will have to apply this with respect to uh the the situation on the ground but this was not the, the question about uh sorry to be that long no problem on the contrary uh we, we really uh, cherish uh, that you share your own experiences also when you were a national minister uh, i have a, a couple of questions <laughs> regarding the um the the problem of say follow-up of the judgments of the european court of justice in luxembourg and you refer to that yourself already um, there are issues of non-implementation, for instance, by Poland of the April interim order with regard to the disciplinary uh, chambers. There, is, uh, there are issues such as non-implementation by Hungary of the asylum uh, judgment of the European Court. Uh, how does the Commission see that and uh, when do you plan to return to the European Court of Justice? Uh, here I will give you a, a simple answer where we see the uh, need to act and we will not hesitate to act when we see no implementation. At this moment, we are at that stage with Hungary. We are asking uh, uh, this uh, very, very short uh, uh, deadline for, for the answer and for the action for full implementation of the decision of the European Court of Justice in case we do not get satisfactory uh, response, but especially the, the real action on the ground, we will not hesitate to come back to the court and ask for the sanction. The same applies to the disciplinary chamber in, in Poland, where we uh, are monitoring 
uh, how the interim measure has been applied. Well, the problem in Poland and, and you who are following the situation know it well, the disciplinary cham chamber stopped uh, being uh, uh, active in disciplinary proceedings, but they are doing something worse in my view, and not only in my view, they are uh, leading or running the procedures, lifting the immunity of the judges on, on the criminal justice line. And this is uh, unacceptable, and that's why we are also acting in this direction. So, well, believe me, we act every time we see uh, the need and where we have the robust legal uh, situation to be safe, uh, because we we want to we want to win these cases. I cannot imagine one day we will lose the case relating to the rule of law, because th there is too much at stake. This, these are the infringements which are based directly on Article 2. And we have to really always have a, a very good legal, legal analysis. And of course, there is a lot of criticism that we should be less legal and more political. Uh, this is always a very difficult uh, discussion in the Commission and, and uh, also very difficult uh, 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 considering all the pros and cons, and believe me, if I if I have uh, bad sleeping because of something, this is exactly this this issue. I don't want to contribute to your uh, to sleeping issues, but uh, yes, okay. more in, enjoy. You will not be because whatever we do on rule of law, whatever we do, nobody applauses. Uh, no, 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 nobody is satisfied. Yeah. For, for many, it's not enough and for many, it's too much because what is at stake is also, let's face it, the sovereignty of the member state. And, and this is unprecedented situation. And that's, that's why I wanted to say uh, we must not make mistakes. But I, uh, Mr. Mr. The Chair, I didn't want to silence you. <laughs> Sorry to, for Sorry. interrupting you. Not at all. No, I, I was about to say uh, I have some other questions which I hope will not uh, deprive you of your uh, well-deserved sleep. But there is one question uh, which looks at the other uh, um, dimension, namely the dimension of national constitutional courts. And for once we turn to Germany, because as you know, in May last year, we had a rather, uh, let's say, remarkable judgment of uh, the court, the German Bundesverfassungsgericht in Karlsruhe, the Weiss case. And uh, we remember that the commission was indeed investigating whether that judgment itself uh, could be seen as in non-compliance with European Union law, and in particular, the supremacy of European uh, uh, Union law. Is there anything uh, in your analysis that you could uh, report us about? Yeah, first of all, I would not call it re remarkable judgment. <laughs> if if we put a positive <laughs> sign to the word remarkable, it was the judgment which, which shocked all of us who understand the whole architecture of, of the EU law. And the judgment is putting into question the, the basic basics, the comp competence of the European Court of Justice which we stated it clearly the day after, has the last word on the interpretation of the EU law and on the matters which fall under its competence. Uh, of course, there, there, are, there are other things which uh, I would not call remarkable with a positive, <laughs> positive uh, sign. Uh, there is, there is a, a, a new uh, development now. We asked Germany for uh, give for uh, a response. Uh, we wanted from Germany the, the, their analysis and their uh, proposal of the way for, for the way forward. And uh, we will come back soon with our response. Uh, soon, I would like to be clearer about that in February. Uh, of course, we need to have a discussion in the Commission, but I said clearly recently well, what the, what the court in Germany did, it's, it's as if you are removing the, the basic wall in, in your house. If you do that, the house ruins and, and this is something we must not allow. Uh, instead of making chaos and uh, uncertainty 
uh, putting into question the institution like the European Court of Justice, my God, this time we need stability and predictability. And I think this is also the Commission role to, to guarantee that. So uh, you will hear about us, uh, uh, I, I hope, in the next uh, several weeks, because I think that the, the, the Commission desperately needs to take a position. Also, in light of all the other uh, procedures uh, and rule of law issues in, for instance, in Poland and Hungary. We have to be clear on, on, on Germany as soon as possible. Thank you very much. I still have three uh, rather specific questions. Can I ask them to you and then uh, more or less towards the end of the uh, the meeting? I love specific questions so I have the answers. Try. <laughs> okay, we'll try. First of all, uh, one of our participants asks something about the tools that uh, the EU might have regarding what he calls um, abusive litigation against investigative journalists or civil society organizations and human rights defenders, because those groups are very often the, the target of that form of intimidating abusive uh, civil lawsuits or even criminal uh, prosecutions. So that's one specific question. Shall I go one by one? Or yes, please. Yes. OK, let's let's start with this one. Uh, this is the so-called slap, uh, the abusive litigation, uh, which uh, in fact means that the law and the judicial system turns against the freedom of speech <laughs> when it is abused. This is the situation. Now I will give you an, an illustration. Daphne Caruana Galizia, the, the murdered Maltese journalist, at the moment of assassination, she was facing um, almost 50 uh, litigations, mainly in the United Kingdom. And, and the, the family is still uh, dealing with those, those cases. You can imagine how demanding not only financially it is. So we do not want ju justice system to be abused. And we want to come with the initiative in the fourth quarter of this year uh, against this practice. Uh, we are now working intensively on mapping all the possible cases and the uh, reaction. Uh, I hope uh, I would like to, to uh, produce a directive, but we still have to work on the content because we, we relate the format to the or derive the format from the content. And we uh, will look into internal civil law procedures. Uh, and cross-border civil law procedures, and especially uh, sub, sub pieces of the of, of the international uh, private law will be checked. So I, I know you you needed a quick a quick uh, reaction. So the fourth quarter, you will see uh, the per, the piece of our production. Hopefully, it will uh, be proportionate, but I am sure it's necessary. Thank you very much. I have another uh, question with regard to the Citizens Equality Rights and Values Fund. And the question is, how is the programming progressing and how will the Commission involve civil society in that process? Mm. Yes, uh, we uh, are progressing because, you know, we have freshly adopted the budget. Uh, we have quite reasonable money in it. There will, not, there will never be enough money. Uh, so, but, but we are in a, in our programming, reflecting the new needs and new, uh, pressing issues, uh, so that we do as much as possible benefit with, with the, the amount of money, money we have. And I promise, uh, there will be a public consultation, uh, on, on the programming because, uh, we. Of course, we cannot only consult with some uh, chosen uh, NGOs, for instance, but, but we will consult it widely so that we, uh, especially for the sake of uh, relevance of, of, the, of the objectives uh, which, which we will want to target. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, maybe a last question has to do with the citizens panels that you have evoked. And the question is how are they going to be formed? Will they be formed at the national level? How are they going to be representative of the diversity within communities, including at the local level? And 
a question also whether the voices of migrants will be heard in those citizens' panels. I will give you an honest question uh, answer. I don't know yet. Uh, this is in the making. Uh, the objective is to uh, involve the people in the in the debate uh, as fa as fairly and objectively as, as possible. So, the, of course, the, met the method of of uh, choosing the people well, it's it's strange to say that but by by that but in inviting the people to the panels uh will will be uh well designed uh, uh for uh, as for the migrants well i i am not sure uh how how to do that uh, definitely we want to have a have a discussion with the european citizens uh who should should have a voice here and uh, i have uh, another concern, uh, what shall we do with the answers of the citizens? <laughs> because we have had some attempts in the past, uh, always <clears throat> good intention, <clears throat> which led to hell, if I can put it in, in this brutal way, that, that we keep asking the people about their op opinions and then we are uh, rather uh, short in in working with with the answers and this has to be two ways communication and 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 we mean it this time to do it well that's why i believe also that the electronic uh uh system will help uh, to to make the the debate two two ways but also quick and and rich uh well we we have very honest uh, intention here to in, invite as many as people as possible uh uh, with uh, an open possibility for every everyone, because I don't believe we can only discuss with those who will be somehow uh, uh, proactively invited. Thank you very much, Ms. Vice President. I think we are coming to the end of this sec uh, session. You, you highlighted that you have an ungrateful position in the sense that there is always criticism of those who do think that you go too far, others who think you're not going far enough. We know, however, also based upon what you conveyed to us during this lecture, that the Commission to, for us continues to be an extremely important, honest broker. The Ehrliche Makler that Walter Hallstein already highlighted in the 1960s. And we, we continue to, to put our trust in that respect in the European Commission as a honest uh, broker. May I really, on behalf of the whole uh, Reconnect Consortium and all of the more than 500 participants in this online event. Thank you very, very much for engaging so openly with us. And we really count on continuing the dialogue with you and um, your fellow commissioners in uh, the months and year to come when our project draws finally to a close. If you allow me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to also make a few announcements about staying in touch with the Reconnect project because we have quite a number of upcoming uh, events. Uh, in fact, already next week on Thursday, the 11th of February, we will have a roundtable on EU values are law. After all, a new look at systemic infringement actions were based upon a recent publication of uh, Professor Dimitri Kochenov and together with the Dutch Equality Commissioner and Professor John Morijn, Senior Judge and Professor Kees Sterk and Professor Kim Lane uh, Skeppel and Professor Kochenov, of course. Then we will have on the 24th of February a symposium that we organize jointly with Verfassungsblock and Democracy Reporting International. And that symposium focuses very, um, say, um, importantly on emergency measures and COVID-19. And last but not least, but you find more information on our website. We are launching a, a series of events, a series of panels and uh, debates to assess democracy and rule of law backsliding, not just in Europe, but outside of the EU, in other countries in the world. We have professors and experts talking about the United States, about India, about, uh, say, other countries um, that will come up and that I'm sure will also put things in perspective and show us that these are not just European issues and problems, but really things that concern the whole international community as well. Ms. Vice President, we are deeply grateful for your time and for your very important, uh, say, uh, uh, messages for us. Thank you very much. We wish you a good continuation of 
uh, your great work. And to all of you, we wish you a great day and please stay tuned with the Reconnect project. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you for your attention and, and congratulations for all, all you are doing and uh, what a rich program you have ahead of you. I am really tempted to join <laughs> as a listener to, to get some new inspiration. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.